Okay, chapter four is called the Arrangement of Electrons in an Atom. So we're looking at electrons and where they are located in the atom. Um, electrons are important in chemical bonding. They are what um, are either gained or lost or shared in order to create a chemical bond between atoms. And so we're looking at where they are located. And that will help determine what kind of bonds they're able to produce or able to form. Uh, we are going to start out with looking at light because this is the process scientists went through. They were studying light. They moved from light to electrons. And so we're looking at the properties of light first today. So we're going to look at the mathematical relationship between speed, wavelength, and frequency, and energy. Um, the dual wave particle nature of light, the significance of the photoelectric effect, and then the Bohr model. So electromagnetic radiation is a form of energy that exhibits wave-like behavior as it travels through space. So anything that is a wave that travels through space. It does not need a medium. So that can be visible light. It can be radio waves, gamma waves, and anything in between. And putting these all together forms the electromagnetic spectrum, which this is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, gamma rays are, this is in wavelength, and they're really small. So the smallest wavelengths are gamma rays. Smaller the wavelength, the higher the energy. So these are very high energy waves. X-rays, ultraviolet. And then this little section right here, that's the only part of visible light. So we can only see this little section of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And we go from lowest wavelength, our purples, and then red is the highest wavelength, longest wavelength. That's what Steve said. Yep, it's a prism How that's breaking away. That they can measure them. They can measure them, but they. they no, it's not colors. They aren't colors then. <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe they would show up as a color if your eye was able to. I don't know. They have instrumentation that measures, like, radio waves is a wave. And so, like, your radio picks up radio waves. Different thing. It's light is part, visible light is part of the whole spectrum. Oh, I thought you meant, like, light. No, it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, infrared heat waves, you can't really see infrared heat waves, like, exactly, but you can see the distortion formed from them, like when you're driving down the highway, a really hot highway on a really hot day, oh, you see those waves. Like yep. Well, it's more in the air where you can kind of see really it. Squ well, But that is the heat waves. That's the infrared. Or if you have those infrared heat cameras or infrared goggles, you can see ghosts. Um, you can see where heat, like maybe the FBI and people, if they're searching for someone, they can use those to find where heat if people are, body heat. They can see body heat and stuff. Um, that would be measuring infrared heat waves. Uh, microwaves are on this this spectrum, and TV and radio waves are the longest waves. <laughs> this is just a picture of the spectrum, so we're going to skip over this one. Okay, some of the terms you need to know with light is wavelength and frequency. Wavelength is the distance between corresponding, corresponding points on an adjacent wave. So if this is my wave, that actually is pretty good. From here to here, from peak to peak, this is our wavelength represented by lambda, a Greek letter lambda. Or you could go from trough to trough. They'd be the same wavelength. You can go from any point. So you could go from the downward slope halfway here to halfway here. That would still be lambda. All these would be, as long as they're the same point of the wave, you can measure the wavelength. 
lambda. Lambda. Frequency, now this is really a Greek letter, but we'll call it V because it looks like a V, um, is defined by the number of waves that pass a given point in a specific time. So like six waves per second versus 10 waves per second. That would be your frequency. I think this one is called rho. Is it rho? No. I'll have to look it up for sure. I looked it up once, but we never, I never call it, I always call it V. But it kind of looks like an italicized V. So frequency and wavelength are mathematical, mathematically related to each other, and they're, ma they're related by this constant C, which is the speed of light. And C has a value of 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So that's C. They, let's look at how these are related to each other. So if wavelength goes up, if C never changes, what would happen to ha have to happen to V? Would it have to go up, down, or stay the same in order to keep C the same? What? If lambda goes up, what has to happen to V in order to keep C the same? Got to go down, right. They're inversely related. Um, hertz, our frequency is in S minus 1. So frequency is like waves per second, and waves isn't really a unit, so it's really just per second, or you might see it like in this right here, S minus 1. That means that seconds are in the denominator. The unit you will probably see more often is a hertz. Hertz is the unit for frequency, and we represent that by an HZ. Or you have megahertz, an MHZ. This is showing the relationship between wavelength and frequency, where here's a long wavelength, and this is a short wavelength. Which one has a higher frequency? Yep. So higher frequency, lower or shorter lam um, lambda or wavelength. They're inversely related. Okay, photoelectric effect is related to this. We are looking at um, the energy, the frequency of the waves and how much energy they carry, and that energy being transferred to electrons in a metal. So the photoelectric effect refers to the emission of electrons from a metal when light shines on the metal. And the quantum of energy is the minimum quantum of energy or quality of energy that can be lost or gained by the atom. So these, this light is shown, shines on a metal. This light is incoming. It carries a certain frequency. That frequency is going to, we'll see Max Planck relates that to energy. It transfers that to this metal, and electrons are able to come off. And the way they measure that is they have a cathode and an anode here, and they're able to measure the charge or the current that would flow, th flow between the two. Okay. We have a video about this that would hopefully help. Hold on, let me make sure I have the volume set correctly. When light strikes a metal surface, electrons may be ejected. This process is called the photoelectric effect. Each metal has a characteristic energy level. If the incoming light is below this level, no electrons will be ejected. For example, this red light is not sufficiently energetic to eject electrons from cesium metal. Yellow light is also not energetic enough to eject electrons. Green light is energetic enough to eject electrons and current flows. Okay, so you notice right here, did you notice that they gave the wavelength of the light? Mm -hmm. So it started out with 700, red had a 700 um, nanometer wavelength, and 
what was yellow? Five, 570. 570. And so, and then green was 530, and it was able to have that, or emit the light. So we're going to see that wavelength is also related to energy. And what is color? How do you see color? What's the reflection of a wavelength? So there are specified wavelengths that are reflected to your light. And your eye has the, the rods and cones in the retina, and the, your brain is able to change that to a color. You recognize it as color instead of a wavelength. <laughs> and so your, the, whatever color you're looking at, so my coat reflects the blue, but it absorbs everything else. Because there's all kinds of wavelengths hitting your clothes, your clothing, or whatever. And so it absorbs color and absorbs some wavelengths and reflects some wavelengths. Photoelectric effect, so Ma Max Planck was studying the photoelectric effect, and he saw that relationship between energy and frequency, and he has this equation, E equals HB, where E is the energy in joules, V is the frequency in hertz, or S minus 1, and then H is a constant that we'll always use as 6.626 times 10 to the negative 31st, so this should be an exponent, it's 10 to the negative 34th. Uh, joule seconds. I would give you this constant, like for a test or quiz, I will give you the constant, but you may need to know the equation on your own, okay? You might need to know those two equations, but I would give you what C and what H equals. Um, so a photon is what we they decided to call the particle of electromagnetic radiation having zero mass and carrying a quantum of energy. So this is this little packet of energy that get, that's hitting the metal, gets absorbed, and ejects a, um, an electron. And it depends on the frequency of the radiation, so they just kind of tweak this to mean the energy of a photon is equal to HV. Okay, let's look at this one. In 1900, Max Planck theorized that a hot object does not emit electromagnetic energy continuously. Instead, Planck suggested that objects actually emit energy in small, specific amounts, or quanta. Energy, he said, was quantized. In other words, the energy being emitted has only certain values, almost as though the energy is a packet. Some wavelengths of light carry only a little energy at a time. Others carry more, but the energy is always quantized. It is always in terms of the packet. The smallest possible amount, one packet or quantum, is defined as the minimum quantity of energy that can be gained or lost by an atom. Quantization becomes important when light or another form of energy interacts with an atom. Sometimes the incoming energy is enough to make something happen, other times it is not. Think of rolling a ball out of a pit. The energy must be enough to get the ball out of the pit all at once, or the ball will simply roll back to the bottom. Even if the energy of multiple rolls would add up to enough energy, the ball will not have been able to get out of the pit because the energy of each hit in itself was not sufficient. With enough energy in a single hit, the ball escapes from the pit. Similarly, if the packet of energy is not large enough, the atom is unaffected, despite the fact that the packets of energy keep coming. If the packet of energy is sufficiently large, however, the atom is affected. An electron, for instance, may become excited. Okay, so that's what we have. These electrons are gaining enough energy, enough uh, packets or quanta of energy are being absorbed, that the electron's able to leave the surface of the metal. 
Sometimes they just raise energy levels and then drop back down, and sometimes they would escape there. Oh, did it switch or not? Yeah, there's two of them. The energy of a photon is equal to the product of Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon. 93.7 megahertz is a common radio broadcast frequency. If we substitute 93.7 megahertz into the equation, we get the energy of the photon. This equation can be looked at differently by using the relation. The frequency of the photon is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. This means so, yeah. that the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of a photon. Blue light has a shorter wavelength than red light. From this relation, we can determine that blue light is more energetic than red light. Okay, so they didn't do a very good job, I don't think, of going through how they get this equation. But if we get, we're given this original equation, we rearrange it for V, so V equals C over lambda, substitute this in for the frequency in the Planck's equation, and so we have H times C over lambda. When you take a number multiplied by a fraction, you can just multiply it by the numerator, right? So HC all, all over lambda would be your um, relationship between, so this is between wavelength and energy not just frequency and energy. Now, when you do a calculation, I don't think you need to use this equation, per se. You could put um, wavelength into this equation, solve for frequency, take that number, put it into this equation, and then solve for energy or whatever. It's, it, either way, it's fine, but you don't have to, you don't, I think you just need the two equations. You wouldn't have to know the three. Mm -hmm. That I'm not sure. Get in the middle. I'm not sure. Yeah, because you'd think that if they combine even their wavelengths would, I don't know how that does that with wavelengths, I'm not sure. <laughs> the lowest energy state of an atom is called the ground state, so when the atom is in ground state, we're saying it's in resting state, the electrons are close, as close to the nucleus as possible. Then it gains energy, and the electrons go to this higher energy state, which is called the excited state. So when scientists pass electric current through a vacuum tube with just hydrogen gas in it, they observed that there was a pink light that was emitted. Um, when a narrow piece of the, uh, narrow beam of the light was shined through a prism, what does a prism do? Deflect, uh, refracts the light, yeah. And what, what do you see then? Right, and it bends the light so you can see the continuous spectrum. For Usually you see prisms in the window, right, and you get a rainbow on the wall. Well, they did the same thing, but instead of getting this continuous rainbow, there were only bands of light. So one color of light here, one color of here and specific wavelengths, and every hydrogen gas would emit that same wavelength pattern. And that's called the line emission spectrum. So this is the spectrum, line emission spectrum from hydrogen. This light gets passed through the prism, and you just get these, one, two, three, four, five. I think on the previous slide it said four bands. This really violet is really hard to see, because usually the background's black. Um, we'll see that when we look at the spec, um, through a spectroscope, but so it is, you see just those lanes. So you can actually determine what gas you're looking at based on its spectrum, because every gas is unique. But this, this isn't gas, give off a 
Mm -hmm. It would have a, when you combine those together, so when you combine those five, that's why it was pink instead. Um, so different colors, different wavelength combinations give you colors, different colors. So Bohr came up with this new model um, for the electron and said that the electron can only circle the nucleus in this orbit. Like the planets circle the sun, they can only stay on this one orbit. Um, the energy is higher than when electrons are in orbits that are farther from the nucleus. So there, it's saying like Mercury could jump up into Earth's orbit and back but not in between, it's just like electrons could be in this orbit and they can jump up but not in between. Um, we'll see that this model is not really the present day model. Um, we know that they're in, you've heard of the electron cloud before. Okay, and the last thing we're going to look at here is the, we have four different models. Oh, never mind, we didn't look at. In the late 19th century, this is good. scientists observed that a characteristic lavender light was produced when a high voltage electric current was passed through hydrogen gas. When the lavender light was sent through a narrow slit, then through a prism, it separated into distinct lines of different colors. In 1913, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr proposed a model of the hydrogen atom that explained atomic spectra. The Bohr model introduced the idea of quantized energy states for electrons in atoms. In the Bohr model, the electron moves in circular orbits about the nucleus. According to the model, the electron can circle the nucleus only in allowed paths or orbits. When the electron is in one of these orbits, the atom has a definite fixed energy. While in an orbit, the electron can move to a higher energy orbit by gaining an amount of energy equal to the difference in energy between the orbits. When a hydrogen atom is in an excited state, its electron is in a higher energy orbit. When the atom falls back from the excited state, the electron drops down to a lower energy orbit and a photon is emitted. The emitted photon has an energy equal to the energy difference between the higher energy orbit and the lower energy orbit. Okay, so what, what's important here is that we have An emission and an absorption spectrum, and so lot energy whoops, energy is absorbed. Electrons move up to a higher energy level, and when it drops back down, it's emitted. So light's emitted, and um, each each atom will emit a different color of light. This is just a picture of that, and so that's what's happening in the fluorescent lights in the school or anywhere is that there's a current running through those gases in that tube and the electrons are being excited and they drop back down to ground state and they're emitting a certain wavelength of light. Uh, so I want you guys before the, we line up and sit in line, um, these are called spectroscopes and what you do is you point this little slit, it's going to pass the slit through a diffraction grating and you'll be able to see uh, the bands of light that's produced by these lights and I want you to compare that to the sunlight because sun over by the window should produce all wavelengths. The worksheets are due Friday. <laughs>